All right, the book of Matthew chapter one, we're gonna start reading in verse 20. And it says, as he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David, the angel said, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. For the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit and she will have a son and you were to give him the name Jesus. Somebody say Jesus. Jesus. For, oh, you can do a lot better than that. Somebody say Jesus. Jesus. Come on, let me hear. Say Jesus. Jesus. For he will save people from their sins. That's a very, very encouraging statement. Verse 22, all this occur, occurred to fulfill the Lord's message through His prophet, look, the virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. The most defining event in human history has gotta be the birth of Jesus. When God became a human being and stepped into our story, when God became man and dwelt among us, and the birth of Jesus is the reason for Christmas. An amazing event because before the birth of Jesus, people might have thought about God and they might have said God is perhaps aloof or God is removed or God is distant or austere, judgmental, perhaps even cruel. One to whom we must bow to, one that we must fear. But when Jesus came, all of this changed. The birth of Jesus meant so much to you and me uh, as Jesus changed the perception that we have of God. When, when Jesus was born into this world, when Jesus arrived, He declared God in a completely different light that He wasn't just a God who was out there and a God removed from our story. When Jesus was born, He wasn't born into a palace or into, a, into a, even a five-star hotel. When Jesus was born, He was born into a manger, a stable. You know, when Jesus was born, there was no room for Him at Bethlehem Hotel, no room for the carpenter's wife. No people were set aside when Jesus was born, only, only sheep and donkeys. Have you ever stopped to consider that the first scent Jesus ever smelled wasn't perfume or disinfectant, you know? I've been in the delivery room a few times at the hospital and it's just the overwhelming, sorry, at the hospital, yeah, and the overwhelming smell is just one of disinfectant. But when Jesus was born, He wasn't born into a sterilized delivery suite. Jesus was born in a manger. The first scent that greeted Him was dung and, and odor of the scent of animals. When we think about Jesus, that the first hands that ever touched Jesus weren't manicured. You know, we're in our, we're in our social media baby birth generation, right? We're, 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 we're women who know they're about to give birth to a baby, get their hair straightened and their nails done, you know? So the first Instagram image of them with their baby is looking good for all their friends. So much pressure. I mean, you know, I feel for every mum, you give birth to a baby, it should be, hey, photo free zone for a while, you know? Instead, you've got a click happy husband or, you know, family member right there with a camera saying, smile. I mean, I don't know how, I don't know how mums do it. All I'm saying is they're faking that smile. That's, that's all I'm saying. <laughs> but you know, when Jesus was born, it wasn't manicured fingernails. His, his mother didn't have her, her hair straightened. She wasn't in, an, in, in a five-star hotel or an optimal hospital environment. She was, she was a carpenter's wife, fresh on a journey from Nazareth to Bethlehem. Her hands were callous. There was dirt under her fingernails. She was weary, not just from giving birth, but from the, the trauma of life. He wasn't born in a cathedral. He was born in a stable. There were no robes. There were only rags. Jesus didn't come high. Jesus was born into our world low. And you know, when we think about Christmas, we're surrounded by imagery. I mean, everywhere you go, where I live, uh, my neighborhood is like where everybody wants to go trick-or-treating at Halloween time. And my neighborhood is kind of one of those neighborhoods where everybody likes to get ahead of the curve. And so, you know, people started decorating their homes in my neighborhood for Christmas. I'm not joking, on Labor Weekend. One of my neighbors just across the street had their whole house completely decked out 
with lights on the outside of their house at Labor Weekend. That's just plain wrong. Anybody agree with me? You know? I mean, you know, we're doing well to get our Christmas tree up yesterday and, you know, feeling guilty that it's the second of December. But where I live, the party's been underway since October. And when we wander around, you know, everybody's got an image of what Christmas looks like, right? I mean, we're here in New Zealand. In fact, in the service that I'm in this morning, we just had snow in the middle of our praise and worship. And, uh, you know, it's pretty cool to have snow falling, but we're in the Southern Hemisphere. You know what I'm talking about? Like we, we watch the reindeer with their sled and then we go outside in our jandals and make a barbecue, you know? <laughs> Dive into the pool if there's one nearby. And, and when we think about Christmas, there's so much imagery and I'm not sure it always helps us to see the real message of Christmas because we see, we see, um, we see trees and, and I've been to Bethlehem and there's not a lot of trees there at all, let alone perfect manicured fir trees. Not a single one did I see while I was there. You know? And when we think about it, Mary's head didn't have a, a gold shroud around it, you know, which is in a lot, so much of our imagery. When Jesus was born, just a baby was born. In fact, if you were in Bethlehem that night, many people would never have even known that Jesus was born that night. Just a baby popped into the world. And it's amazing to think there's no, there's no secret service detail, no one, no parade, no one like here's Prince Jesus, you know, marching down the street, no paparazzi, just, just a baby was born. Jesus arrived. He arrived the lowest of the low that you can possibly arrive into this world. Yet from the moment that Jesus arrived, everything changed. Yep. I mean, when Jesus, when Jesus began the, the period of his life where he displayed his godhood, you know, he, he prayed for people and their lives were healed. People who, people who were caught in desperate circumstances, made poor life decisions, found freedom and a second chance. People who were unclean were cleansed of their uncleanness, adopted back into society. Families were restored. Funerals were ruined as dead people came to life again. Jesus came into our human story and the world has never been the same again. Why? Because with Jesus, God's Son, being born into this world, God entered into our story. He entered into our pain. He experienced our humanity. I don't know if you're coming to this Christmas and you're feeling lonely or have ever felt lonely, but I want you to know that so has Jesus. Jesus was lonely. Have you ever thought about your life and felt that you're misrepresented? Well, Jesus certainly knows what that feels like. Ever been betrayed? Well, so has Jesus. In fact, we got his betrayer's name, it's Judas. Ever suffered for doing the right thing? So has Jesus. Ever, ever had a reason to live wounded or to live with unforgiveness? So has Jesus. And at, at his birth, the angel said about Jesus to Joseph, you will call him Joseph. Oh, sorry, Jesus. You will call him Jesus. Let's get that right. But then a couple of verses later, it says they, speaking of you and me, it says they will call him Emmanuel. His, his, his name that he's titled is Jesus. But the phrase that will describe what he did is Emmanuel. They are gonna look at him and they're gonna say, Emmanuel. In other words, God is with us, God with us. That's what the word Emmanuel says. And we're here launching a series in our church over, over the next um, three Sundays, morning and night, and we're calling it Unwrapping Christmas. And there's no better place, I think, that we can start when we're trying to unpackage and unwrap Christmas than to consider the fact that, that they said about Jesus, they will call Him Emmanuel. That in the birth of Jesus, we realize that God is not out there. God is not even up there. That God is right here. That God is present. That God is involved. That God is not a million miles away. He is engaged and present. Our God is with us. That's Jesus. He is our Emmanuel. Religion does a pretty great job of making God distant. And, and it's so much about imagery. When we think about God and we think about what it means to connect with God is that somehow we've got to climb the high stair or we've got to attain to the standard or we've got to, we've got to, we've got to reach up to a God who is somehow right there. But, but Jesus came to declare, it's not about religion, it's about relationship. 
It's not about a God who is distant. In fact, right where I'm speaking this morning, the roof of this auditorium, the St. James Theatre, has cherubim or angels on the roof of the, of the very theatre roof. And when we think about Jesus, it's easy to buy in to all the messages that come to you in populist imagery, in commercialized Christmas, and to think of Jesus and to think that somehow He's out there, but He's not. Christmas is a bold declaration that God is right here, that He is present, that our Jesus is involved. He is available to you and me. Hey, Jesus is empathetic. There's nothing you're going through that He doesn't understand. He is concerned, He is near, and He is not out there, He is right here. When we think about Christmas and we think about the different people that are hearing this message, walking through the journey of Christmas, you don't need a God who is right out there. You you need a God that is right here. Christmas, Jesus, is a declaration that for every single one of us, God is our Emmanuel. He is the God who is with us. Hey man, if you're a young mom hearing this message today and you've got a couple of kids under five, then just firstly know you're gonna make it, all right? You know, there's there's life beyond it. They do eventually feed themselves and wipe their own bottoms. You know, it gets better, stay with the journey. But in the middle of that tired season where you're struggling just to be the parent that you'd like to be instead of the grumpy one that perhaps your extreme exhaustion lends you towards, You need to know that God is not another thing that you've got to attain to, another standard that you've got to reach for. He's not a God who's beyond you. He is the God that's right there when you're trying to calm that baby at 2.30 in the morning. He is the God who is there for the weary, there for us when we'd like to do better. He is the God who can take the edge off our anger, who can calm our anxieties. He is a declaration. Jesus was a declaration. I am right here. I care about you. I'm on board. I'm engaged. I'm involved. For a teenager that's hearing this message this morning, you need to know that Jesus is not a declaration of a religious standard imposed by parents or a community upon you that somehow is just another burden, like another exam you've got to pass or another environment of peer pressure that you've got to navigate your teen years through. Quite the opposite. Jesus is a declaration that God is with you in your exam room, not sitting the te- not setting the test, but sitting the test with you, not imposing pressure, but a God who is with you in the middle of that pressure, helping you to navigate a true you in the middle of every pressured environment that you face. That's the Jesus we're talking about. For business people that are out there, you need to know that God is not somebody who is who is just looking at us and, and somehow watching over and removed from us, but a God who is present in that boardroom. Present, present when you're trying to make a budget work, when circumstances and, and even natural disasters are changing the circumstances of your business. Know that God is not just removed from it. He is there in it with you. He wants to be involved. He cares about you. If Christmas is a message of anything, it is that we serve a God who is right here. Jesus is our Emmanuel. They will call Him Emmanuel, meaning that our God is with us. One of the best examples I can think of the God who is with us in the Scriptures is the story of three young Hebrew boys in a, in a foreign kingdom called Babylon. It's in a book called the book of Daniel. And the three boys' names were Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and because they refused to bow to the social pressure of their age, they were thrown into a fiery furnace. They wouldn't bow to a golden uh, statue. They said, no, 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 there's only one person to whom we bow, and that's our God. So they were thrown into a fiery furnace for their willingness to tow the populist line. That's amazing, isn't it? And in the middle of their fiery furnace, The Bible tells us that one other appeared. They looked into the fiery furnace. Now, you know, I've been near fire, and I can tell you that fire changes people. I mean, it kills people, right? But here they are in the middle of the fire, and instead of being dead, miraculously, these three boys are alive. 
And they're not alone in the fire, there's somebody else. And when I think about Emmanuel, and I think about this fourth man, we talk about in our Christian faith, the fourth man in the fire, because we know his name and his name is Jesus. God jumped into that fire with Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. And when we think about what it means to worship a God who who calls to us and says, I am your Emmanuel, I am the God who is with you. This, This fiery furnace presents the best case, I think, for us to understand what that means. Because a lot of people are saying, well, if God is real and if God cares about people, then why do all these bad things happen? Where was God when? Dot, dot, dot. And they begin to list off human events or, or things that have taken place. And they say, well, where was God in the middle of that? Where was your God when? And this gives us the best example because the truth is, friends, that our God does not impose worship of Him on anybody. Doesn't impose His moral standard, force you to be an automaton robot that naturally abides to ethical principles and rules. And the same freedom that you've got, unfortunately, is the same freedom that everybody else has got. Meaning that in order for you to be you and God to freely allow you to live your life, then bad things are gonna happen in this world. And we shouldn't blame God for them. We should blame ourselves. But what we learn from Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego is the answer to that question, where was your God when? And the answer is, He is right there. When I'm facing circumstances or you're facing stuff in your life that is overwhelming, that is, is, you're staring death's door in the face, when you've got pressures that are overwhelming you or when people have neglected or betrayed you and me, we can take tremendous solace, comfort, strength, dignity, from the fact that we see in this fiery furnace a true picture of where God is, guys. He is right there. He is with me. He is in the fire. He is in the trial. He walks with me through the hospital. He walks with me through the bankruptcy court. God is with you and me no matter what life throws at us. Are you glad about that today? That's Emmanuel and that's the God that can make a difference. Not a God aloof and removed who somehow can't ever be touched or connected with, but a God who says, I am in, I'm deeply involved. As David said in Psalm 23, you may have heard, it's one of the most well-known passages of Scripture in the Bible. He said, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because you are with me. That's Emmanuel. One day Jesus was walking down a street and there was a leper on the side of the road. And the leper looked up at Jesus, in fact, he stood in front of Jesus and he said, if you are willing, you can make me clean. And the Bible says about Jesus that he did the most remarkable thing and maybe you've missed this, but leprosy is not a disease we experience in New Zealand, but it's an infectious skin disease that is terminal. And the Bible says about Jesus that knowing that this man had leprosy, that he did the most remarkable thing. He reached out and he touched the leprous man. The disease was transmitted through touch and Jesus touched him. Friends, that is amazing this uh, Christmas to know that we worship a Jesus who in the middle of whatever is going on with our life was not only born into our human story, But when we're facing the the worst moments or perhaps when we feel the least deserving or when we're perhaps at the lowest of our low, or let me put it another way, the most unclean of our unclean moments, we don't worship a God who is out there. In this clear story, we see a God who reaches out and who touches us. He says, I'm in it, I'm on board with it. Whatever you're facing, I'm facing. That's Emmanuel, a God who's deeply engaged in whatever I am going through, who says, if you're in it, buddy, I'm in it too. That's the God that we worship. And I believe that's an amazing thing to discover about our God, that He he, he doesn't exclude, He includes and He heals. Um, You know, one day Jesus arrived at the home of somebody who had died. And the man's name was Lazarus and he'd been dead for three days. 
And the shortest verse in the Bible measures the emotional response to Jesus. John eleven thirty five, two words, Jesus wept. And, and those who gave us chapter and verses in the Bible were so right to punctuate that moment and to put in a new verse to mark that when people were experiencing pain and loss, that God was not removed from it. God is not unfeeling. He is not separate to our human condition. Jesus was saying, if you're feeling pain, I'm feeling pain. If you're having a tough time, I am with you. I am the God who enters in to your situation. I wanna help. It's the perfect picture of our Emmanuel. The God who said, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. He is Emmanuel, the God who is right here with us. And we're in the middle, uh, we're starting today a new series called Unwrapping Christmas. We're trying to take off the layers, trying to see more than just the presents and the pressure and the schedules and, and the, the wish lists of children that are way beyond our budget level and the pressure of family members who don't lift a finger to make that Christmas lunch, you know. We're trying to see beyond all of those layers to see the substance of Christmas. And there is perhaps no greater substance, even though we're gonna have another five, but there's no greater substance, I think, than to consider about Christmas than our God is not up there. He's not out there. He's not above it or over it. But in fact, God is right here. Not up there, but right here. And not over it. Our God is in it. It's easy, I think, to see God up there. But it's a far more radical thing when you and I begin to realize that He's right there. When I'm on the stage, God is with me. When you're in that seat, He is right there, available. And you know all our God is looking for? He's looking for somebody that is going to invite Him in. Somebody that's gonna allow Him to be engaged in whatever situation they are facing. When those people uh, faced the death of Lazarus and they welcomed Jesus to their home, do you know what they did? They said, we might be feeling so aggrieved right now, but Jesus, would you come in? And the Bible is so amazing as it declares that Jesus empathized with their pain and then he called Lazarus back to life again. And when Emmanuel is welcomed to be Emmanuel. I want you to know that no matter what your uncleanness, your pain, your loss, your feeling, whatever you're going through today, that if you would do what Martha, the brother of Lazarus did when she said, Jesus, come to my house. My brother is dead, but come. When the leper said, I am unclean, but if you are willing. When people choose to welcome Jesus in, to their story, they give him the opportunity to do what only he can do, and that is to bring the God factor to our lives. When we stop to think about Christmas, we come face to face with the, the fact that he is our Emmanuel, Jesus, and when he is welcomed into every environment, any part of our human story, then he is able to do what only Jesus can do. Some of the most amazing moments of my life have been when I have been in the middle of some situation, stopped, realized that Jesus is my Emmanuel and intentionally welcomed Him in. Moments perhaps of pressure when I just stopped and said, I, Jesus, this is huge pressure, but I need your peace. I'm gonna be honest and say I've done that multiple times this week. Moments of conflict where I've said, Jesus, I don't know how these relationships get put back together, but you are the God of reconciliation. Would you come and bring these two pieces and make them whole again? Moments of confusion. Ever felt like that? Just overwhelmed by circumstances and pressures and just, ah, oh, I don't know where to turn. And I've just stopped and said, Jesus, I need your clarity. Or perhaps moments when I felt unworthy. And I've just said, Jesus, I need your righteousness. 
And friend, it doesn't really matter what you and I are going through or how bad we might feel or whatever life is serving up for you. What you and I need to know today is that we serve a Jesus who said, I am born in the stable. I am born, I am born in the worst of circumstances. I'm living an ordinary life. I empathize with one and with all. And when I am welcomed in, I will bring change and healing to that life. Jesus is our Emmanuel. And to the saint and to the sinner, to, to the person who feels really great today and the person who feels a million miles away today from God, you and I all need to become acutely aware that the greatest gift on offer this Christmas is not on your, to -do, your Christmas list and it's not available on a website, but the greatest gift is Emmanuel, a God who is with us in every moment and in every situation of life. Can we give a big clap for our Emmanuel? Can we? Come on. In every campus, I'm just gonna invite the band to come up on stage with me, but I wanna talk to you as I, as I finish out this talk about five different uh, reactions or five different people who can react to our God who is our Emmanuel. And those five different groups, I'm calling them the sinner, the saint, the skeptic, the scorner, or the searcher. And it is easy to think about God and to think about Emmanuel and to think of yourself as a sinner. That's our first category. Someone who is unworthy. I speak to people all the time. In fact, I would go far as to say every, nearly every week in our church, somebody will come to one of our services and discover the most radical thing you can know. And that is that nobody is unworthy of a relationship with God. In their own right, we're all sinners. But Jesus, when He died on the cross, He paid the price for my sin. And no matter who you are, my friend, somebody might even have, you know, perhaps acknowledged God in some way as being involved in their life. But you need to know that even when we fail God, He never fails us. Even when we are unfaithful, he proves Himself faithful. And for the sinner, we need to know that even in our most horrible moments, He is still our Emmanuel. He's still in our human condition. He still touches the unclean. He still cares about the faulted and the flawed and the fallen. He is the God of the sinner and the God who lifts us out to make us whole again. The second category is the saint. When I think about Emmanuel, I reckon a lot of people don't put God at the center of their lives because they think of themselves as a good person. In my mind, good people, people who think of themselves as good, are perhaps the most dangerous people in our community, cause actually the most pain because nobody is good enough for God. We all need Emmanuel. In fact, the Bible says, talks about our lives and it says our righteousness is like a filthy rag to God. He is not good. God is not good. He's perfect. We're not looking for, for good people. We're looking for perfect people. It puts us all in the same box and makes us know that everybody needs Emmanuel. The third company of people, I think, is the skeptic. The skeptic. Because we are so bombarded with so much imagery and so many visual pictures that we see that put God right up there, you can be tempted into thinking that God is not available to you right here. And maybe the greatest tragedy of your life could be to allow doubt to rob you of what it's like to live your life in close relationship with God. David wasn't kidding around when he said, man, the Lord's my shepherd. And when I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I actually know no fear. And immediately, hundreds of people are like, what? <laughs> but God's our Emmanuel. When His reality takes center place in your life, the skeptic finds themselves confronted with the God 
who can bring the most amazing peace in the worst moments of our lives. The scorner, the two th- there were two thieves who were crucified on the cross with Jesus. They were on either side and our Savior in the middle. And one of them was scornful about Jesus. Ha, if you're the Son of God, save yourself. And the other man said, we deserve to die for our sins, but this man, Jesus, does not. Would you remember me, Jesus? And Jesus turned to this guy and he said, I'm gonna see you in paradise. And the final, final person you can be when you're thinking about Emmanuel is the seeker. Isn't it a weird thing to know that God is literally right here, yet still we must seek Him. Jeremiah uh, 29, 13 says, you will seek me and you will find me when you search for me with all your heart. He is right here. He is right here. You know the greatest thing we could do about with Christmas, the greatest thing we could do is actually just be a seeker of God. Actually just choose to involve God in our lives. This Christmas, that's a radical thought, isn't it? When we're actually coming around the birth of Jesus to put Jesus at the center of the birth of Jesus and be a seeker of Him, take some time. Don't just get an advent calendar with a with a bit of chocolate on it, but get a little thought in your head every day that He's Emmanuel, man, that He's right here and He's involved in my life and He wants to have a relationship with me. That could change your circumstance. In the middle of my pressure, in the middle of my hurt, in the middle of my stress or anxiety, or in the middle just perhaps of a life that feels like it's lacking in reason and significance, I can find everything that I need when I find Emmanuel, the God who is right here, no matter where you are today, the God who is right here and available for you and me, that can bring all the change in the world. So we, we, we're kicking off this series today, but I want to start with just not every person knowing He's your Emmanuel. And He cares and He loves for you. Hey, He's right here. Could you stand together with me this morning? I'm, I'm about to release every other location. But before we do, I want to pray this morning. I want to pray for every single person who's here today. Because I just have this feeling that there are many people who are facing all kinds of situations. People got sick children, sickness in their own body, facing business pressure, relational strife, a lack of resources and you're staring down the face of Christmas trying to make your kids' dreams come true. No matter what you're facing, people feel alone. He is with us. He is Emmanuel. And would everybody, would we just pray just for one second today and let's ask Jesus to come right in to the story of whatever we're facing. Come on, would you pray together with me? Father, I thank You for every person in this room today, in these rooms. I thank You that You are our Emmanuel, that You care, that You are involved, that You are engaged, that if we're in the fiery furnace, You're with us. If we're feeling unclean, then You touch us. If we are alone, then You befriend us. If we're facing pressure, then You are there to help us. You walk with us through everything that we face. And I pray, would You be our Emmanuel? We pray this in Jesus' mighty Name. And everybody said, Amen. Everybody said, Amen, Amen.